In the hustle of life, with all its noise and busyness, it's important to take time to be still, to calm our senses, to renew our bodies, and to open our minds. In this holy place of peace, we speak softly the names of those for whom we pray this morning, believing and knowing that they are cared for and cared about by a loving creator. They are heard, they are blessed, they are loved. A deeper peace calls us as our worldly concerns are set aside and we enter the eternal moment that is beyond our human understanding and experience. Autumn arrives with a quiet grace. There's a gentle crispness in the air as the days begin to shorten, reminding us that time too grows shorter with each passing season of our own life. This season speaks of change. It is a slow, reflective shift, inviting us to pause and notice the beauty in letting go. The fullness of the season has been spent. The time of harvest is upon us. We surrender into the shift of light and temperature allowing and releasing rather than resisting and struggling. The lesson of the season tells us that spring will come again. We have nothing to fear, only to trust. Let us sit in the quiet of our hearts and allow the gifts of autumn to fall freely into the quiet space within. Autumn, with its falling leaves and cooling air, teaches us to trust the process. It reminds us that change is not the end, but part of the ongoing rhythm of life. What we release today will create the gifts for tomorrow. And so it is. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Amen. Just this past week, we shifted into the autumn equinox. And I there, there's so much about autumn that, that's kind of intriguing, paradoxical, if you will. Because on the one hand, autumn has two names. Do you realize that summer, spring, winter, it's only one name for the season. But if I say we've entered the time of fall, you all know that I'm talking about autumn. You're, we're talking about the time of harvest. And yet we, we use the terms interchangeably. And I think that's kind of a, an interesting symbolic thing that is trying to tell us that autumn isn't just one thing. We often think of um, uh, the spring as new life. And we think of the summer as the growing. And we think of the winter as the barren fallow time. But fall has these twin energies that weave themselves in and through its literal change of season, but also the change in our lives. Because first and foremost, we are planting new seeds at this time of year. And at the same time, it's a deep inner calling to reflection. And here's what I mean. This action, we're planting new seeds. One of the things that happens in the fall is you begin to sort out and plant 
the seeds, the bulbs that will bloom in the spring. The tulips, the freesias, the daffodils, all of those um, uh, flowers that we uh, that are so much a part of the spring are just these ugly little bulbs that have to be planted in the fall. It's like they have to, we have to tuck them in somehow, tuck them into the grass and let them sleep. And then they somehow magically know when January, February, March come around that, oh, this must be our time to bloom. They don't bloom in October, November, and December. It's also a time of this ordering and action and clearing in the sense that we are clearing out the closets, if you will. In the old days, you know, you used to have to uh, have a root cellar, and that's where you would keep all of the root vegetables like potatoes and rutabagas and parsnips and turnips. But when it comes time for the harvest, you have to go into the root cellar and you have to clean everything out because you don't want to put new potatoes in with the old potatoes because, of course, it would just make the whole crop rot way too fast. And you need it to last for almost six months until there's a new crop starting to bloom into the fall, I mean, excuse me, into the spring and into the early summer. So what, what a great spiritual metaphor, you know? We cannot accept more until we have used what we have been uh, working on, the insights and the revelations that have been given to us. You cannot accept more unless you make space for it. And that's true in, in your closet and in your root cellar, as well as is, is true in your soul. So this action component. Then there's the reflection component. You know, we sit down at the end, if if we were all farmers, and we would say, what did we plant this year that was a great crop? What did we not do so well? I remember the first time I decided, my father always farmed, and I thought, well, any fool can raise a tomato. So I planted the tomato plants on the north side of the house that got no sun quickly found out that tomatoes need a lot of sun and that crop just completely died. One year, my brother, thinking he would do the same thing, only with squash. And instead of one squash plant, he bought like 10 of them. And as you all know, squash has a huge vine, whether it's butternut or zucchini or summer squash or melons or whatever. They So not only did he have the garden covered with the vines, but I'm, I swear it went to the house and to the entire neighborhood. And he decided that perhaps one was enough. It was going to yield what he wanted to have. But you have to kind of find out the hard way, don't you? You have to do things in life. You have to plant things. And, and I'm talking about literally both seeds as well as in the in your soul. And you go, this is what I was so passionate about. This is what I wanted. And yet it didn't come to a fruition or it came to fruition grander than I ever could have imagined. Because our soul needs kind of a clearing out too. It needs a little bit of empty space for things to take root, for us to plant new seeds and let that crop grow. So I ask you a question today. Have you achieved this year your spiritual insights? I want to be very careful not to say goals. Because goals oftentimes imply something external to yourself. I'm talking about a prayer that you had on your heart and you now have a greater understanding. You have an insight of it. You know, back at the burning bowl service that was in December of last year, 2023, part of that process is writing a letter to God. And I always think that is such a powerful process. And then we hold those letters, and we'll be returning them in the next couple of weeks. Because you know what? I opened that letter and I think I was praying about that in December. Wow, that was no big deal. Or it was just a footnote prayer and it became the, the whole uh, energy of my life in the year 2024. That's why we don't send them back right away because you're still too attached to the prayer. You're still uh, deeply involved in how you want the prayer to work its way out. And in that burning bowl service, I find that one of the most powerful things to say, and I, and I very seldom forget, is the, the quote from Rainier Maria Rilke. 
And he says, do not search for the answers, which you could not be given now, because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the question now. And isn't that what a prayer is in many respects? It's a question. How is this going to happen? How is it going to work out? What am I going to feel about it? Where am I going to go with it? So way back in December, you were you were charged, if you will, to live into the question of the prayer. But it, But now the second half of that quote has more meaning. Perhaps someday if far in the future, you will gradually, without ever noticing it, live your way into the answer. I think that is so profound because you I don't know about you, but I know I'm six miles down the road, if not 106. And I go, oh, that prayer was answered way back then. Or I made it through that challenging time. Oh, that was, oh. And a friend will come and say, how did you get through that? Did did everything come out all right? The what? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I was praying about that. Oh, so long ago. Because I've lived into the answer without even noticing it. So there's this time of reflection and new seed planting based on our reflections of what our journey is to date, just like we're not planting any more tomatoes on the north side, we get it. You know, what is your heart calling? Where is it calling today? You know, you you can't fix everything in one fell swoop, one fell fell prayer to do it all. But your heart has a a space. It's like this is a, you ever felt a soft space on like a fruit or something? It's soft right there. It's soft. It's ripe. This is maybe even overly ripe, like a banana or something. It's ripe, and that's the place that we want to focus on. Or let me ask the question this way. Where do you feel disconnected from God? You know, day in and day out, we go about our business. Do we see our business as always connected to God? Do we see that a loved one who is struggling, we say, well, I don't feel connected to God in that prayer. I don't feel connected to God when this happens or that happens. Where do we feel that sense of disconnect? And that's that soft spot that needs the focus of the clearing and of the new seed planting of faith and love and hope. So we've got action and reflection. Another paradox, we have a harvest and a surrender. Harvest as a metaphor is so powerful in our spiritual journey. You know, in Paul's letters to Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 6, verse 9, he says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap if we do not give up. And there's three places there I want to unpack. Do not grow weary. I don't know about you, friends, but when I'm praying for something for a long period of time, prosperity, health, relationships, I grow weary. I grow weary of writing the same thing in my journal every day. I pray pray that I have increased health. I pray that my loved one, uh, you know, gets over this. And it just goes on and on and on. And we grow weary. I think if there's any model that we as unity have is, of course, our founder, Myrtle Fillmore. You know, we talk about Myrtle's healing back in the 1880s. And she, for those of you who don't know, she had tuberculosis and an active case of malaria. So the short and long of it is she could barely breathe. And over the course of time, she pretty much was told that she had about six months left to live. And she's, I I just, I just can't accept that. Well, as we tell the story in unity, you know, everything gets better with the telling. It's kind of like Myrtle took two affirmations. She called in the morning and she was fine. But the reality is Myrtle Fillmore's healing journey was well over two years. 
two years in the first year she was barely breathing stayed in bed almost all the time upstairs people had to wait on her because she was so weak she couldn't even get out but she made an absolute intention that she would not grow weary of praying for her health seeing her body renewed and restored slowly, and I emphasize the word slowly, gradually, she began to see a shift. And it wasn't for another year that she really began to take on what she might have called her life before that, where she was working with her husband, she was out playing with her children, she was interacting with our neighbors. Myrtle's faith was not that God better show up like this. But she recognized and affirmed the connection that within every cell of her body was the life-giving force. And that's what she held on to. She did not grow weary of that journey. The second part of that phrase is in proper time, in God's time. And I have to tell you, that's a phrase I hate. What is God's time? Okay, is it like Tuesday, October the, uh, the 2nd at 4 p.m.? I get that. I can hang on with a prayer. I can hang on with an illness. I can hang on with a challenge. Till maybe Tuesday, I'll give it to Wednesday, okay? I want to know, inquiring minds want to know, when is God's time? When is the fulfillment of this time, this prayer? You see, and and we struggle to know. And the, and the challenge is, just like in Rilke's quote, it doesn't happen in a nanosecond. It is a gradual working. And you know what? God is never too late or too early. Think about that. Your prayers are answered never too late. Sometimes we think so, or never too early. It's like, I didn't want you to show up like that now. What do you mean? I'm going to take this opportunity. And it's the doorway to the answer of your prayer. God's good time is a process, not a moment. Because God is an eternal now. How can it just be a simple moment in time? And don't give up. Don't give up. You see, God, we have this idea and, uh, and although we, we know better, we still think it, that God thinks like we think, <laughs> which is a really scary thought when I think how I think, that God's plan is an unfolding plan. God's plan for our individual lives is so much greater. And see, I, again, we can stumble on this word plan because we think God has this spreadsheet and this is what I'm supposed to do when I'm age 21, 32, 47, 72, whatever it is. That's not it. It's this unfolding timing in our lives. Some of us unfold quicker, some of us unfold shorter, but we all are in the journey of unfolding because what happens is that when we unfold, as Isaiah tells us in chapter 43, God's going to do a new thing. See, here's the struggle that we have is that we get so focused on the end product and we reset. I am going to win the lotto by Tuesday. I am going to win the lotto by Tuesday. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. I'm going to see myself winning. I see the lotto ticket. I see the number. But God's, God's plan isn't that narrow. It's the field of unlimited possibilities. And at every aspect of our life and every turning point of our lives, there is something new happening. I had a wonderful lady friend here in Tulsa. She was 98, 99 years old. And for some years she had been blind and at that point in time wasn't very mobile. She was, she was in a nursing home. And I would go to visit her. And one day she said, I finally discovered it. I was like, okay, what is it that you discovered? She said, I have been laying here praying to God. Why am I still alive? I can't see. I can barely hear. I can't walk. And she said, you know what I discovered? Here it comes. <laughs> Ready or not. She said, I can bless them. I said, what? 
She said, every person that comes in here, I can give them a blessing. She said, so I have a purpose for being here. I have a reason for staying alive. And I just wasn't paying attention. That was the most profound insight ever. Here was this woman who, for all of our human goals and objectives, couldn't really do anything but she could bless them. And she consciously knew that. So when a, an orderly or an aide or a nurse or a doctor came in, she said, I hope you're having a wonderful day and bless you. She would consciously, intentionally bless them because we reap what we sow. So the question is, how is your life today? And I'm not talking about the external, although that's an extension. It starts here, goes from center to circumference. We nourish the soul through gratitude. You know, Ruth was so tickled that she finally understood. She said, Marianne, I am so grateful I'm here. I'm so grateful I can't see. I'm so grateful that I am where I am because now I have a job to do. I can bless them. She was preparing her ground of being for a new planting. God is doing something new in her life. So we have action, reflection, harvest, now surrender. Isn't that interesting? At a time when you're gathering in, that's what a harvest is, we're taking all the crops and we're bringing them in to the places that we've prepared for them. Everything's cleaned out. We're bringing in the, uh, bringing in the crop. We have to let go. That's a strange paradox of energy, isn't it? Because harvest is about fullness. What is Thanksgiving all about in the original Thanksgiving? We have so much. We have such an abundance that we're going to share with others. Yet we know that right around the corner, the trees are becoming barren. And, and there's this letting go. There's a time and a season and a purpose for everything under heaven, Ecclesiastes tells us. We have to let go in grace. You know, we, we look at the leaves fall and we get, and at, at one point in time, we begin to totally understand with every leaf that falls today over the next couple weeks, is really the song of spring. Have you been listening? Because unless it dies, unless it releases, it cannot be born anew. For every little acorn, you know, I, I love acorns because you hold a little acorn up and there is no way, even if you smash the thing, that you can see an oak tree. You cannot see a 20 foot high oak tree in this little acorn. Doesn't it strike you that if God does that for an acorn, what does he do for you? You can't see the giant oak that lives inside of you. You have to break it open and grow it, right? And so it's necessarily necessary that we release in order to be born again, to be born anew into this, you know, no acorn. You can't look at an oak tree and say, I see the acorn in the trunk and in the branches. And the No, there are new acorns that are in there now. Interesting thing that both spring and autumn are times of preparation. And it calls us to trust in a process that we don't understand and we really don't see. You know, in the spring, it's kind of like lights, color, action, because we see the new flowers and the everything's coming green again and the longer sense of light and it gets a little warmer and fall and the autumn time has darkness, barren silence. It's not as much fun as lights, color, action. Barrenness frightens us. So does darkness. So does silence. It frightens us so much that we do anything possible to keep from feeling, sensing darkness. And although it's a long way away, how many of you have seen Christmas decorations in all the stores? Lights, color, action. We don't want to sit in the silence, in the barrenness, in the quiet. 
it's interesting too that there's the energy in the earth as we go into late October, early November. What do we see? All Souls Day, All Saints Day, and the Day of the Dead. Barrenness, darkness, quiet. And when we're so quick, and it's a societal problem, it's just not mine uniquely. When we're so quick to get the lights up and we're so quick to go Christmas shopping and we're so quick to have that frenzied energy that all too often, sadly, hallmarks the holiday season, we rob ourselves of the ability to grieve. We all have grief, my friends. It's not just the death of the loved one, although it certainly is that. It's the death of a dream. It's the death of our youth. It's the death of, um, you know, we move from the old house to the new house. We move from one place to another. Uh, something that we had planned for doesn't come to fruition. Uh, we, we struggle with those times when we just have to say, I gave it my best shot and it didn't turn out the way I thought. We want that action. We want that frenziness because we struggle to sit quietly with darkness and barrenness. This is a little statistic I've compiled. When a memorial service goes over 45 minutes, people get noisy. They start rocking the chair. There. <clears throat> they start clearing their throats and tapping their watches like, okay, because we as a society in today's world cannot sit in grief for too long. We've, we've narrowed it because we want, we've, we've brought in Christmas early, we brought in Thanksgiving, we threw in this uh, Halloween holiday, which now has lights and all that kind of parties and things like that. So our ability to handle an extended time of grief is gone. We don't have a resilience for it. We don't have the um, the inner ability to just listen to what the darkness tells us, what the barrenness sings to us, what the time of silence allows within. So I invite you as we've come into this fall autumn season but it's really a season of tremendous paradox, both externally and internally inside of ourselves. It's a season of action. Let's get on. Let's clear everything up because the cold weather is coming as it is a time of reflection. It's a time of gathering, even as it is a time of surrendering. It's a, pre it's a preparation for our lives to be in grief and darkness. We all face that season at some point in time. And how do we handle it? What kind of inner strength comes from just sitting in the season we call autumn without rushing to get to the holidays? We're planting new seeds this autumn season, new seeds that will sing the song of spring. Oh, we won't see them right now. It will take months to sit in the question as Relka asked us to do until one day, gradually, without even noticing it, we will see a new crop, a new flower, a new unfolding in our life and in our hearts. Thank you and God bless.